I did my job. Um, okay. <laughs> okay, so um, can everybody hear me? Cool. I'm pretty loud anyway, so. Uh, so, welcome. Um, I'm sure that people will start dwindling in, but for the sake of time, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, thanks for coming, and uh, my name is Lindsay Kofas, and I am a front-end developer at Aquia. And um, my Twitter handle is LittleCope. And this session will be all about screen readers and more specifically ARIA attributes. Um, so I'm making things a lot more accessible using those, uh, using what's given to you. So. Okay, so first, what is ARIA? Um, it quite literally stands for Accessible Rich Internet Applications. Um, and they define ways to make web content and your web applications more accessible and give more context for people who have disabilities. Um, it's really helpful for um, any applications um, or websites you create that are very heavy with JavaScript and very heavy with Ajax, um, but it can help in a lot of different uh, uh, settings. So. Um, but what does that actually mean? Because <laughs> that's a very like textbook definition. It basically gives context and it helps your web content work better with assistive technologies. Um, and we like to contextualize our content and this is a way of extending it to, for people who have disabilities. So um, I'm going to first ask a question that, about screen readers. Has anybody here, I hope, experienced a screen reader? Okay. It's DC, so I hope so. <laughs> Sometimes I've had absolutely no hands come up and I was just like, oh right, I forgot where I was, I'm not in DC. Um, so I, another follow-up question for that is, um, have you ever gone through your favorite site and maybe close your eyes and use voiceover or some other screen reader? A few of them? It's a fun exercise, not always in a good way. It's like an air quote fun exercise. Uh, <laughs> Um, okay, so I'm glad you all raised your hand. And for those that did, um, I'm going to ask you a non-rhetorical question and ask you how you felt. And like I said, not rhetorical. So you can either shout out answers or I can call on you. Frustrated. Frustrated. Confused. Confused. Irritated. Irritated. Oh gosh, nobody was happy. <laughs> I, I forgot to close my eyes. Uh, yeah, but it still it still can. Uh, it probably still will irritate you even if you're not closing your eyes because you know you you, just, you can just imagine um, how someone might feel. Uh, I actually my introduction to screen readers came a little bit earlier uh, than my passion for accessibility. Um, my former roommate was actually blind, and uh, I would ask her constantly how she could understand it, and she said, "You get used to it," and and some things. We were very fast and some things were very, uh, they didn't make sense at all. And I guess she was accustomed to it, but it was kind of like a shrug off. And I'm like, well, that, that kind of sucks that you have to feel that way. Um, so as an exercise, um, I have two pre-recorded demos, um, about 30 seconds long each. Um, hopefully the audio cooperates with me. Um, it's kind of, we're seeing how things go. Um, we did a quick test, but uh, something I want you to listen for is what you would expect if you didn't have to rely on sight for this, um, like what you would expect to hear. So I'm going to make this bigger so y'all can see it because I am talking about accessibility. All right, and play button. So remember, listen for things that you would want context for. Okay, so um, I'm glad you all have had experience with screen readers so you didn't absolutely hate me <laughs> <laughs> listening to that. I've had some people look like they wanted to kill me after playing this, but, um, but yeah, so um, 
What were things that you thought went well with that? And what were things you didn't like? Does anybody want me to replay it? The menu was effective, however, the search feature was a nightmare. Okay, yeah. Anything else? I don't like how the, the main content on the page was not even mentioned as one of the first most uh, options to drill down into. Yeah, it actually did, um, but that wasn't in that video. But that is still good to point out because I, I had cut it out because I wanted to focus mostly on the navigation, but I'm glad you pointed that out because that's important. Pop up, show up where you can actually skip the content. Yeah, um, yeah, so that was, that. they do actually do that. Now I'm like kind of like, oh man, maybe I shouldn't have cut that out. They do do that, so don't don't yell at Twitter, because then they'll be like, "Who's this little coke girl? Who's that's my uh, Twitter name? Who's this person uh, hating on us?" But those are all good um, examples. Um, I can tell you what I like about it. Um, I personally really like that my uh, profile picture it, right next to the tweet button has uh, it tells me that there's something there. It says pop up, um, so that way I know okay something is under there. If I press something, something's going to come up. And I, I know that there's a pop-up under there. So it's really helpful. And especially on an application that a lot of people use, it's really important to care about these things. So. Okay. So um, I'm going to do this again. Um, Twitter isn't perfect, but it's better than most. Um, what, one that's actually notoriously bad are shopping websites, which I find really ironic because that's where money is. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, to save you and myself from frustration, I'm only going to the top, the little tiny nav that is going to be bigger because I'm about to explain it for you. Um, this, I'm just going to be going over this top menu up here. So weird. Internet link. Skip to the next You are going to link inside HTML content. To click this link, free standard check of your browser security plus internet terms. You are going to link check. You are going to link link. It's in this link link. You are going to link link. It's inside HTML content. To click this link, press start. Control option. Press space. To exit this link, press start. Control option. Press space. To exit this link, press start. 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 Press space. Okay, so I, I know at least one thing on just that top part alone that bothers me, but I want to see what bothers you. Didn't tell you what the link was. Yeah. Where do we even work? Yes, there's that um, contrast. And then, so the one thing that bothered me is um, if you go to the Under Armour website as a visually capable user and you go to that US thing, it is actually a drop down of countries. And I was trying to access it and it took me to another page instead of letting me just go directly to the other country. And that's not providing the same experience for everybody else. Um, Granted, I technically could go, because now I'm on a page where there's a region list, but if I'm just trying to do a quick jump to the country that I belong to, that's a lot more confusing. So, another thing to think about. Okay. So, how can ARIA help? So, first things first, this is something that you have to think about, we have a lot of learned cues that we don't really think about anymore. Like hamburger menus and X's for mobile menus. Um, a, hamburger is, or a hamburger menu is a learned symbol. Three lines, I mean, it might, that might be learned behavior, but you wanna, you wanna indicate to somebody that it's not just lines, it's a mobile menu. And with an X, we have clothes, I mean, I guess, if it's also learned behavior, but you want to be uh, you want to be fair to people and give them that same experience. Um, so, are there page or categories on a page that need additional context? So, for example, when you have dates, you know, if you have the year 2017, 2016, 2015, 2014, those are all years, and you know, those have context on their own, but these are categorized categorizing past events, and that adds a little bit more context. 
And then, all of us are familiar with this. Are you forced to use divs <laughs> sometimes in your CMSs? Like, views usually has uh, output with divs. It's a little bit better. You can have a little bit more granularity and control with that in Drupal 8, but still not perfect. Um, th that's sometimes a good use case for that. So, we're going to go, I'm not going to go over the whole list because that would keep you here for hours and hours. But um, I do have on my resources slide a list of all the ARIA attributes. I'm going to go over the ones I've seen the most personally and talk about what they mean. So first role, I, I'm not 100%, don't quote me on this, but I think it's one of the few ARIA attributes that doesn't have the word ARIA in it. Um, but role is used to describe uh, widgets or structure, and they're also very important to the presence of divs. I've also seen them um, in anchor tags uh, when they want to rely that or they want to relay that they're a button. So um, popular attributes are article, banner, button, form, main, navigation, region. The list goes on. I also provided a list in my resources slide of that. Um, you can't put whatever you want in there. There are like set values. Um, so these are the ones I've seen the most. I'm going to show you a quick example. So right here is just a quick cut of what I played for you earlier, just a much shorter version. So here we have the roll button. I honestly don't think it's useful to make it a button because the home is a link, but it, it does announce as a button because we have a roll button there. So even though it is technically a link. So. All right, so the next two, um, I'm going to kind of brush by the definitions um, and give you the, go straight to the example. So um, that's because it's really confusing to understand it from just a textbook definition and you get it a lot better with an example. And I'm saying this from personal experience, not understanding the difference for quite a while and then finally having an aha moment. Um, so, ARIA described by um, identifies the element or elements that describes an object. Um, the value is a string that matches the ID of an element that is used to describe it. So, um, whenever you have an element, um, you have an ID, you know, proper ID form, and then whatever is within the, that tag gets announced when there is an ARIA described by that matches that ID. You'll see that in the example. ARIA labeled by is almost exactly the same definition, um, but I identifies the element or elements that labels the current element, and the value is also um, form is formatted the same way, and it is a string that matches the ID of the element that it's used to label it. So we're going to cut to the chase of the example because those examples sound or those definitions sound almost exactly the same. But the way I would like you to think about it, since we're all Drupal developers, is think about it with help text and labels in a node add form. So, um, and we use help te text to describe what's going on in that input, right? Or what's gonna happen with that input. And then we use the label to label the input. That's the best way that I've seen these attributes used. Um, so. We're gonna make this a little bigger so you all can see it. Okay. And I'm gonna quickly play, then we're gonna go over the markup, and then we're gonna play it again. I know it's repetitive, but this is really confusing, so I just wanna make sure that you guys get the, uh, the context of it. So I did not get this from Twitter because personally, I thought Twitter didn't use it very well. I, I saw they had these attributes, um, in, within the markup, but I, I didn't like it. I didn't think it was done well. So I found this on CodePen and it's uh, sourced in uh, the next slide. This is a note about the field. You are currently in this field. To add your text in this field, type. 
Labeled by my scribe by example, this is additional labeling from edit text. This is a note about the field. You will not have a text field to enter your text in this field. Time. I'm so glad y'all are DC people, because you don't hate me for this presentation. <laughs> Um, okay, so let's go over the markup really quickly. Yeah. Feels so weird. Okay. So, we see here, we have an ID, additional label. And it says this is an additional label info. So the, the one right below it is a normal form. No ARIA attributes in it. It just has a four attribute in the label that, that matches up with the ID and the input, and that's how they are matched. It's very basic. The next one has a ID of labeled label, and then it has a labeled by additional label and labeled label. So what it reads out is both the, this is additional info up here, and then also the labeled by example. Uh, yeah, labeled by example. And then the next one, it's ARIA described by ARIA described note. And then it announces after that input. Now, I'm going to ask you, does that make sense? Yes? No? Because it was really confusing for me. Yeah, it's okay if it's a sort of, but uh, if you don't 100% get it, but you kind of get it, have some empathy for yourself because I've been doing accessibility stuff for about a year and a half now and I, it took me probably forcing myself to do this presentation to understand, understand the difference between the two. Um, so, I'm gonna go back one and just play this one more time so it kind of seals the deal into when you're listening for those now that you've seen the markup. You are not in text field. To enter text in this field, no type of label by example, this is additional label from edit text. You are not in text described by example, edit text. This is a note about the field. You are not in text field. To enter text in this field, no type. Label by my scribe by example, this is additional label from edit text. This is a note about the field. You are not in text field. To enter text in this field, no type. Fabulous. So does that make sense to everyone? A little bit more than before? Yeah. I think when since we're all Drupal developers, it's always good to use the um, metaphor. Well, I guess not really a metaphor, but like just thinking about help text versus the um, input labels. Okay. ARIA Expanded. So um, ARIA Expanded is probably... From my own experience, I don't know if statistically this is correct, but from my own experience, I feel like this is the one I see the second most. Um, and basically what it does is indicate whether the element or some other grouping um, is expanded or collapsed. Um, it's helpful for buttons that present sub-items, and it takes on a, boole a Boolean as the value, so either true or false. Usually, ARIA expanded is triggered by a JavaScript event, so... Um, It'll change the boolean depending on some event the user. So here um, we see that whenever the search bar has examples that are expanded, um, you will see in the markup that it has expanded true right here. Um, and then when it's closed, we have the expanded ARIA expanded false when there isn't anything there. So, pretty simple. People tend to get confused with ARIA pop-up, uh, or ARIA has pop-up rather, and ARIA expanded, and the main difference is ARIA has pop-up is a property that does not change. Um, it doesn't change based off of something with the user. It either has a pop-up or it doesn't. And expanded is more about whatever the state is, depending on uh, any sort of user behavior. Um, so, it defaults as false, so it, unless you, unless you uh, set it to true, there's no point in having an ARIA has pop-up false in your markup, because if you go and inspect all the fun layers in your DOM, 
you all will see that that's a property of it and it's false. And then, so if you wanna set it to something that is true, you would say aria has pop up equals true. So, and uh, I uh, called this out when, uh, when we were going through the Twitter example, but one way that I thought it did it well was um, this example. Also, um, another thing I uh, noticed too is like they also have a roll button. Uh, even though this is te technically an anchor, it has the roll equals button there. So it says it's a pop up button versus this is a pop up. Just another, you know, layer of fun there, or what I consider fun, maybe not everybody else. <laughs> Okay, Aria Hidden. So, to be honest, I actually used to really hate this one because I thought it was really discriminating. <laughs> like, why would you ever hide something from a user? Um, so, there's actually a lot of good reasons to hide something from a screen reader. Uh, I know that sounds really counterintuitive, but you'll hear me out and you'll see in the example. But um, it indicates that an element or all of its descendants um, are not visible or perceivable to any user implemented by the author. It can also mean that it's, uh, it's helpful when there are items that impact styling but have no semantic value. So um, sometimes like decorative things that you know, don't really, you don't want it to be announced by a screen reader because it might just make it more repetitive or confusing or whatnot. Um, this also takes on a Boolean, true or false. So um, in this example, it has, we have uh, the home button and there are four spans here and one of them has an aria hidden equals true. So um, I'm not sure how experienced any, is how much experience we have about accessibility here, but I'd like somebody to take a guess about why we have four spans and then we have one that has an aria hidden true. Anyway, I got it. Are these all within one link, maybe? They are all within one link. You're on to something. I want to step further, though. <clears throat> okay. So um, I'm going to go ahead and play this. And you'll see what it you'll hear what it reads out. Okay. So if you caught that, um, what it did read out was home, current page, and new tweets available. So basically um, what this application does is it sees where you are, sees if there's tweets available. And it points to whatever uh, whatever class that corresponds to that state. So, why, with, with that being said, why would we have one that says aria hidden equals true for that first one? It's redundant. Exactly. So the the last three have nothing to do with what we see at the end. That is all context for screen readers. The first one, that's for the people who can see. That's for the people, but we don't want that redundancy, right? Otherwise, it makes it a lot more irritating, makes it a lot more confusing. So um, you can see why someone might hate it at first, like me, <laughs> but then you're like, oh, okay, I see how that's put into place, and I see why that's important. And um, sometimes hiding some things from the user um, is good because we don't want to irritate them. It's basic empathy. So, all right, ARIA label. Um, this is the one that I, I tend to try to use as the last choice, um, but this is the um, one of the few, if not the only, um, one that takes any string that you want to give it. So it is um, it defines a value that labels the current element. So whatever is within that attribute is what's read. So um, in the wrapper around the message, the retweet, the like, and the whatever, I forgot what that button is, direct message, I guess, um, button, there is a wrapper and the ARIA label says tweet actions. And it's not corresponded to any IDs, it's not a Boolean, um, so it's literally whatever you make of it. 
already required. This is one I see a lot with um, HTML4 forms um, that have wrappers around them. Um, this sort of indicates to, um, to the user whether or not it is required. I don't have an example of it because I think it's the most obvious <laughs> one, um, but it also, um, there's a required attribute in HTML5, so you don't really need that for HTML5 forms. Um, it's mostly helpful with HTML4 forms. So, all right, so speaking of HTML5, um, HTML5 versus ARIA. So um, a lot of ARIA attributes came about because of these, like there's empathy coming out for users, we wanted to make things more accessible, there's Section 508 compliance, things like that were getting much more attention. And now, and HTML5 wasn't quite there yet, but now that we have HTML5, there's a lot of semantic value in our HTML. And if you can fix screen readers issues with HTML that's semantic, do it. Only, the only reason why I would say do both is browser capability, but then it's still probably redundant. Um, <clears throat> because when it comes down to it, we want to keep our uh, we want to keep our HTML as simple as possible. And uh, screen readers tend to actually really respond to well-designed HTML. All right, another thing, if you get nothing else from this, I want you to remember this, um, human testing is actually valuable. Um, we're in the DC uh, techosphere over here, so I, how many people have gotten those long reports of 508 issues? Yeah. <laughs> so those those issues or those uh, those reports they can be really daunting, um, but sometimes you don't catch things like our aria th or aria uh, attributes. They're not technically wrong, but they don't make sense on a screen reader. So we still want to think back. We want to rewind and say, okay, it's technically not wrong in their report, but we still want to have empathy for our end users. Um, so I recommend actually testing things um, with a screen reader. If you don't have a lot of budget, it, you, can, you don't have to go through advanced JAWS testing, just do a quick tab around and make sure things make sense. Um, tabbing, at VoiceOver is built in, uh, if everybody here uses a Mac or you have that, and then there's also a lot of uh, free tools that I also linked in my, uh, in my resources slide. So um, just do a quick check. You, don't, you might not have to do the most advanced testing available, but just making sure it makes sense. making Because your gut check here is really important. That's how you learn about it. You can do accessibility testing if you're a nice person, which I'm going to say all of you probably are. So, all right. And this is another one. Build with accessibility in mind. ARIA attributes are meant as an afterthought. They're not meant as a first stab at something, and they're not used to fix things. You should be have fixing things with good HTML practices, good accessibility standards, and if you're just like, okay, that is technically right, so I'm not gonna break any 508, Section 508 compliant reports, but I want to add a little something that makes it more, makes more sense. And so build with the accessibility basics first, and use ARIA if it just needs a little bit of additional context. And shameless plug, if you need introductions on accessibility, I presented on it and linked it. So, so um, there's a lot of accessibility issues in the triple uh, core queue and probably a bunch of other module queues, but I didn't have enough time to go through every single module that's you know, in Drupal to say all of the, uh, all the issues that are existing, but there are tons. And you can contribute by just going through your screen reader and noting issues. And documentation is also a very important thing for, uh, for contributing to Drupal. So uh, I there's a link here to Drupal accessibility features, and then I also linked to the uh, core Drupal issue queue with the uh, filter up down of accessibility. And here are a list of resources. Um, and yes, that is it. Any questions? Yes? 
Sorry, but I missed the first five minutes. Do you put up a link for your slides? Uh, I put my Twitter on, but I also am planning on trying to um, link it to the actual page of my uh, the Drupal GovCon page. Okay, cool. So um, I will be posting this. Um, my Twitter handle is littlecope0903, and I always post things there. You know, if I can't figure out how to post it on the um, site, which I should, because I helped the development of it. <laughs> So let's hope I know what I'm doing there. Um, so if I don't do it there, I will most definitely do it on my Twitter. So um, if you want me to say that again, it's Little Cope, K O P E 0903. Any other questions? Yeah? Now I'm trying to imagine what I would want if I were, you know, since it's a visually oriented person, if I lost my sight, how would I want the web page to be presented to me? I'm thinking about the first example you had, and I'm, I'm kind of thinking I would like it to say, this is a page with a banner across the top and, and the content organized into three columns. Mm -hmm. Is there any way to do that? Um, yeah, there's actually, I would recommend checking out the link that I gave you, because um, off the top of my head, there's so many ways to do it that I'm like I'm not sure which one to give you, but there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of different ways in um, or a lot of different aria attributes. Most of the ones that I did focus mostly on state of things versus like nav or like having the nav and the presentation of things. But usually, how a screen reader reach, reads HTML is just from top to bottom. So proper organization of your HTML is usually a good thing. Semantic markup. So, for example, there are in HTML5, we have things like section tags, we have main tags, we have nav tags. So, it'll announce properly if you're using those uh, semantic HTML. And um, there's also things that you can use, like, for example, something that Twitter does that isn't technically on the page is they have a span and they use some JavaScript Ajax Voodoo to say, hey, new tweets can't be If that makes sense. Sorry, my thing froze because I got so distracted with your good question. So basically, I would that those are the things I would think of first, and then I would also use some spans and use some JavaScript to attach that to kind of be like, okay, like that's how my thought process would be of how I would approach it first. And then, you know, of course, that's my that's my first answer is and my first gut instinct. But there's probably a better, more researched way to do it, but I would think, okay, I see that that, when, I, when I'm on a Twitter page, the screen announces to me when new tweets are available, and it says, press this to view them. That's how I think about, okay, it will announce, this is how many columns there are, right? But it might announce something different if you're on a mobile phone, because you're probably not going to have three columns in a mobile phone. So that's how I would kind of think through the problem and kind of take it step by step. So, does that help? Yeah, cool. Yeah? Um, speaking of the thing you just mentioned with new tweets available, mm -hmm. I had to use it on a project and I tried to read, I was so confused about, I guess it's the ARIA Live, mm -hmm. and it's like you can do light or uh, other things that scream at you the second it happens. And like I read all these differing accounts of like how annoying it is and when you should yeah. use the polite one and not. And, I was just so confused. Uh, so, I can appreciate that it's really confusing. Um, the question was like, kind of, how do you know with certain ARIA attributes when they have, give you lots of options of how to announce something, which one do you choose? And this is going to be probably a slightly infuriating answer because you're probably looking for something more specific, but my answer is trust your gut. If it annoys you, like there's, like just take out the requirements of your project for a second. I know, don't hate me project managers for saying that, but like, just think about it like, you know, all right, I know I have this deadline in this, but th does this annoy me? If I didn't have this deadline, would this annoy me? And would I have time to fix it? And then that way, if you have that, you can present that information better to your project manager. And even if it's not something you can do now, you can say, okay, so this is what I tested. Maybe if you're doing an agile process, maybe this is a ticket I can put on the backlog and when the client decides that they want to prioritize that, we can add that and we can start working on that. So. Yes? Do you use Wave for testing? I do use Wave for testing. Um, I use Wave more for um, 
like when I'm first building a site. And when I first build the site, what I'll do is before I touch any of the styling, I'll make sure that the markup makes sense. Um, and I, they will pretty, Wave's really good and it'll tell you um, like errors and it'll also tell you alerts where it's like, this is kind of funny, yeah. but technically you won't get sued for it, which you still should care about it. Yeah. Suing should not be your only motivation of caring. Um, you should like care about people, but you know, that's another thing I could ramble on for years about. Um, but uh, yeah, the errors are the ones you should probably prioritize at first if you have like a you know really tight budget. And then kind of the same thing that I was telling um, is that like um, prioritizing from like and giving even like talking to your managers and being like, hey, I found this issue and I think it's important to solve. It's not the highest priority right now, but um, we should talk to a client about it and put it maybe in the backlog so that way we can uh, groom it and you know focus it on for the next sprint so um but there something i will recommend though is testing against other tools besides wave because sometimes like certain things catch different things like they're not unfortunately they're not all consistent and there's not a one one accessibility checker 